Hello everyone and welcome back to Law and Court Cases. In today's video we are going to be talking about one of the most infamous serial killers of all time. Attorney Polly Nelson described him as the very definition of heartless and evil. Today we are covering Ted Bundy. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Ted Bundy was born Theodore Robert Cole on November 24th of 1946 to Eleanor Louise Cole at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont. His biological father's identity has never been confirmed. His original birth certificate apparently assigned paternity to a salesman and United States Air Force veteran named Lloyd Marshall, though a copy of it is listed with his father as unknown. Louise claims she met a war veteran named Jack Worthington, who abandoned her soon after she became pregnant. Census records re reveal that several men by the name of Jack Worthington and Lloyd Marshall lived near Louise when Bundy was conceived. Some family members expressed suspicions that Bundy was sired by Louise's own father. However, in a 2020 documentary film named Crazy Not Insane, psychiatrist Dorothy Otwell Lewis claimed she received a sample of Bundy's blood and that DNA tests confirmed that Bundy was not a product of incest. For the first three years of his life, Bundy lived in Philadelphia suburb of Roxbury, Pennsylvania, with his maternal grandparents Samuel Cole and Eleanor Miriam Longstreet. They raised him as their son to avoid any social stigma that could accompany birth outside of wedlock at the time. Family, friends and even young Ted were told that his grandparents were his parents and that his mother was his older sister. Bundy eventually discovered the truth about his family, although his recollections of the circumstances varied. He told a girlfriend that a cousin showed him a copy of his birth certificate after calling him a bastard, but he told biographers Stephen Mookard and Hugh Ainsworth that he found the certificate himself. Biographer and true crime writer Anne Rawl, who knew Bundy personally, wrote that he did not find out until 1969 when he located his original birth certificate in Vermont. Bundy expressed a lifelong resentment towards his mother for never telling him about his real father and for leaving him to discover his true parentage by himself. Bundy occasionally exhibited disturbing behaviour at an early age. Louise's younger sister, Julia Cole, recalled awakening from a nap to find herself surrounded by knives from the kitchen and her three-year-old nephew standing by the bed, smiling. In some interviews, Bundy spoke warmly of his grandparents and told Rawl that he identified with, respected and clung to his grandfather. In 1987, however, he and other family members told attorneys that Samuel was a tyrannical bully who beat his wife and dog and swung neighborhood cats by their tails. He also expressed racist and xenophobic attitudes. In one instance, Samuel reportedly threw Julia down a flight of stairs for oversleeping. He would sometimes speak aloud to unseen presences and at least once flew into a violent rage when the question of Bundy's paternity was raised. Bundy described his grandmother as a timid and obedient woman who periodically underwent electroconvulsive therapy for depression and feared to leave their house towards the end of her life. These descriptions of Bundy's grandparents have been questioned in more recent investigations. Some locals remembered Samuel as a fine man and expressed bewilderment at the reports of him being violent. The characterization that Sam was a raging alcoholic and animal abuser was a convenient characterization used to justify why Ted was the way he was, said one of Bundy's cousins. From my limited exposure to him, nothing could be further from the truth. His daughters loved him dearly and had nothing but fond memories of him. In addition, Louise's sister, Audrey Cowell, stated that her mother could not leave the house because she suffered a stroke due to being overweight but not mentally ill. In 1950, Louise changed her surname from Cowell to Nelson and at the urging of multiple family members, left Philadelphia with Ted to live with cousins Alan and Jane Scott in Tacoma, Washington. In 1951, Louise met Johnny Culpepper Bundy, a hospital cook, at an adult singles night at Tacoma's first Methodist church. They married later that year, and Johnny formally adopted Ted. Johnny and Louise conceived four children together, and though Johnny tried to include his adopted son in camping trips and other family activities, Bundy remained distant from him. He later complained to a girlfriend that Johnny was not his real father, wasn't very bright, and didn't make much money. Bundy varied his recollections of Tacoma in later years. To McCord and Ainsworth, he described roaming his neighbourhood, picking through trash barrels in search of pictures of naked women. And to attorney and author Polly Nelson, he said he pursued detective magazines and crime novels for stories that involved sexual violence, particularly when the stories were illustrated with pictures of dead and maimed women. In a letter to Rule, however, he asserted that he never ever read fact detective magazines and shuddered at the thought that anyone would. He once told McCord that he would consume large quantities of alcohol and canvass the community late at night in search for undraped windows that he could observe women undressing through, or whatever else could be seen. Psychologist Al Carlisle claimed that Bundy started fantasising about women he saw while window peeping or elsewhere. 
and mimicked in the accents of some politicians he listened to on the radio. In essence, he was fantasising about being someone else, being someone important. Bundy's childhood neighbour, Sandy Holt, described him as a bully and a mean-spirited kid. He, quote, liked to terrify people. He liked to be in charge. He liked to inflict pain and suffering and fear. She also alleged that Bundy engaged in animal cruelty. He hung one of the stray cats in the neighbourhood from one of the clotheslines in the backyard, doused it in lighter fluid and set it on fire, and I could hear the cat squealing. She claimed that Bundy would take younger children in the neighbourhood into the woods and terrorise them. He'd take them out there and strip them down, take their clothes. She said you'd hear them screaming for blocks. I mean, no matter where you were, you could hear them screaming. Holt added that Bundy made makeshift punji traps around the neighbourhood, injuring at least one girl. One girl went over the top of one of Ted's tiger traps and got the whole side of her leg split open with the sharpened point of a stick that she landed on. Accounts of Bundy's social life also varied. He told journalist McCord and Ainsworth that he chose to be alone as an adolescent because he was unable to understand interpersonal relationships. He also claimed to have no natural sense on how to develop friendships. I didn't know what made people want to be friends, Bundy said. I didn't know what underlay social interactions. Some people perceived me as being shy and introverted. He said, I didn't go to dances. I didn't go on beer drinking outings. I was a pretty, you might call me straight, but not a social outcast in any way. Classmates from Woodrow Wilson High School, however, told Rule that Bundy was well-known and well-liked, a medium-sized fish in a large pond. Bundy's only significant athletic advocation was downhill skiing, which he pursued enthusiastically with stolen equipment and forged lift tickets. During high school, he was arrested at least twice on suspicion of burglary and motor vehicle theft. When he was 18 years old, the details of an incident were expunged from his record, as in customary in Washington and many other states. After graduating from high school in 1965, Bundy attended the University of Puget Sound, UPS, for one year before transitioning to University of Washington to study Chinese. In 1967, he became romantically involved with UW classmate Diane Edwards. Bundy later described Edwards as the only woman he ever really loved. In early 1968, Bundy dropped out of college and worked a series of minimum wage jobs. He also volunteered at the Seattle office of Nelson Rockefeller's presidential campaign and became Arthur Fletcher's driver and bodyguard during Fletcher's campaign for Lieutenant Governor of Washington State. Edwards graduated in the spring of 1968 and left Washington for San Francisco. Bundy visited her later that year after he earned a scholarship to study Chinese at Stanford University that summer. In August, Bundy attended the 1968 Republican National Convention in Miami. Shortly thereafter, Edwards ended their relationship and returned to her family home in California frustrated by what she described as Bundy's immaturity and lack of ambition. Psychiatrist Dorothy Otno Lewis would later pinpoint this crisis as probably the pivotal moment in his development. Devastated by the breakup, Bundy traveled to Colorado and then further east, visiting relatives in Arkansas and Philadelphia, and enrolling for a one semester at Temple University. It was also at this time in early 1969, Rule believed that Bundy visited the Office of Birth Records in Burlington to confirm his true parentage. Bundy was back in Washington by the fall of 1969, where he met Elizabeth Kloffer, a single mother from Ogden, Utah, who worked as a secretary for the UW School of Medicine. Their tumultuous relationship would continue well past his initial incarceration in Utah in 1976. Bundy became a father figure to Kofler's daughter Molly, who was three years old when he started dating her mother. He remained in her life until she was aged 10, after he had been arrested. As an adult, Molly wrote of incidents beginning at the age of seven in which Bundy was abusive and sexually inappropriate with her. Her accounts included Bundy hitting her in the face, knocking her down, putting her at risk of drowning, indecent exposure and sexual touching, disguised as accidents or games. In mid-1970, Bundy now focused and goal-orientated, re-enrolled at UW, this time as a psychology major. He became an honor student and was well regarded by his professors. In 1971, he took a job at Seattle's Suicide Hotline Crisis Center. There he met and worked alongside Anne Rule, a former Seattle police officer and aspiring crime writer, who would later write one of the definitive Bundy biographies, The Stranger Beside Me. Rule saw nothing disturbing in Bundy's personality at the time. She described him as kind, salacious, and empathetic. After graduating from UW in 1972, Bundy joined Governor Daniel J. Evans' re-election campaign. Posing as a college student, he showed Evans' opponent's former governor, Albert Rosalini, and recorded his stump speeches for analysis by Evans' team. 
Evans appointed Bundy to the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee. After Evans was re-elected, Bundy was hired as an assistant to Ross Davis, chairman of the Washington State Republican Party. Davis thought well of Bundy and described him as a smart, aggressive and believer in the system. In early 1973, despite mediocre LSAT scores, Bundy was accepted into law school at UPS and the University of Utah on the strength of letters from recommendations from Evan Davis and several UW psychology professors. During a trip to California and Republican Party business in the summer of 1973, Bundy rekindled his relationship with Edwards. She marveled at his transformation into a serious and dedicated professional, seemingly on the cusp of a significant legal and political career. Bundy continued to date Clover as well. Neither woman was aware of the other's existence. In the fall of 1973, he matriculated at UPS Law School and continued courting Edwards, who flew to Seattle several times to see him. At one point, he introduced her to Davis as his fiancée. In January of 1974, Bundy abruptly broke off all contact with Edwards. Her phone calls and letters went unreturned. When she finally reached him by phone a month later, she demanded to know why he ended their relationship without explanation. In a flat, calm voice, he replied, Diane, I have no idea what you mean, and hung up. She never heard from him again. Bundy later explained, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could have married her. But Edwards concluded in retrospect that Ted's high power courtship in the latter part of 1973 had been deliberately planned, that he had waited all those years to be in the position of where he could make her fall in love with him, so that he could drop her, reject her, as she had rejected him. By then, Bundy had begun skipping classes at law school. By April, he had stopped attending entirely, and young women began to disappear in the Pacific Northwest. There is no consensus as to when and where Bundy began killing women. He told different stories to different people and refused to divulge the specifics of his earliest crimes, even as he confessed in graphic detail to dozens of later murders in the days preceding his execution. He told Nelson that he attempted his first kidnapping in 1969 in Ocean City but did not kill anyone until sometime in 1971 in Seattle. He told psychiatrist Art Norman that he killed two women in Atlantic City whilst visiting family in Philadelphia in 1969. Bundy hinted to homicide detective Robert Keppel that he committed a murder in Seattle in 1972 and another murder in 1973 that involved a hitchhiker near Tumwater, but he refused to elaborate. Rule and Keppel both believed he might have started killing as a teenager. Bundy's earliest documented homicides were committed in 1974, when he was 27. By his own admission, he had by then mastered the necessary skills in the era before DNA profiling to leave minimal incriminating forensic evidence at crime scenes. Now moving on to the murders. Shortly after midnight on January 4th of 1974, around the time he had terminated his relationship with Edwards, Bundy entered the basement apartment of 18-year-old Karen Sparks, a dancer and student at UW in the University District of Seattle. After bludgeoning Sparks with the metal rod from her bed frame, he sexually assaulted her with the same rod, causing extensive internal injuries and rupturing her bladder. She remained unconscious in hospital for 10 days, and although she survived, she was left with permanent brain damage, with significant loss to her vision and hearing. In the early morning hours of February 1st, Bundy broke into the basement room of 21-year-old Linda Ann Healy, a UW undergraduate who broadcast morning radio weather reports for skiers. He beat her unconscious, dressed her in blue jeans and a white blouse and boots, and carried her away. Bundy stated he drove Healy to a secluded area where he raped and murdered her before dumping her body. During the first half of 1974, Female college students disappeared at a rate about one per month. On March 12th, Donna Gell Manson, a 19-year-old student at Evergreen State College in Olympia, 60 miles southwest of Seattle, left her dormitory to attend a jazz concert on campus but never arrived. Bundy claimed that he burned Manson's skull in his girlfriend's fireplace, down to the last ash, in a fit of paranoia and cleanliness. On April 17th, 18-year-old Susan Elaine Rancourt disappeared while on her way to her dorm room after an evening advisors meeting at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg, 110 miles southwest of Seattle. Two female Central Washington students later came forward to report encounters on the night of Rancourt's disappearance. The other three nights earlier was a man wearing a sling who was asking for help carrying a load of books to his brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. On May 6th, Roberta Kathleen Parks, 22, left her dormitory in Oregon State University at Corvallis, 260 miles southwest of Seattle, to have coffee with a friend at the Memorial Union, but never arrived. Bundy claimed he had spotted Parks in the cafeteria and persuaded her to go with him to a bar. After they got in his car, he tied her up and gagged her 
and drove her back to Washington to be killed, raping her twice on the way. Investigators from Seattle and King County grew increasingly concerned. There was no significant physical evidence, and the missing woman had very little in common apart from similar appearances. Young, attractive, white college students with long hair parted in the middle. On June 1st, Brenda Carroll Ball, 22, disappeared after leaving the Flame Tavern in Burin near Seattle Tacoma International Airport. She was last seen in the parking lot talking to a brown haired man with his arm in a sling. Bundy stated he brought Ball back to his residence where they had consensual sexual encounters before he strangled her while she was sleeping. Although this failed to explain the damage done to her skull. In the early hours of June 11th, 18 year old UW student Georgianne Hawkins vanished while walking down a brightly lit alleyway between her boyfriend's dormitory residence and her sorority house. The next morning, three Seattle homicides detectives and a criminalist combed the entire alleyway on their hands and knees, finding nothing. Bundy later told Keppel that he lured Hawkins to his car and knocked her unconscious with a crowbar. After handcuffing her, he drove her to Issaquah, a suburb 20 miles east of Seattle, where he strangled her and spent the entire night with her body. The next afternoon, he returned to the UW alley and in the very midst of a major crime scene investigation, located and gathered Hawkins' earrings and one of her shoes where he'd left them in the adjoining parking lot and departing unobserved. It was a feat so brazen, wrote Keppel, that it astonishes police even today. Bundy said he revisited Hawkins' corpse on three occasions. After Hawkins' disappearance was publicized, witnesses came forward to report seeing a man on crutches with a leg cast carrying a briefcase in an alleyway behind the nearby dormitory the night of her disappearance. One woman recalled that the man had asked for help carrying the case to his car, a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. During this time, Bundy was working in Olympia as the assistant director at the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission, where he wrote a pamphlet for women on rape prevention. Later, he worked at the Department of Emergency Services, a state government agency involved in the search for missing women. At the DES, he met and began dating Carol Ann Boone, a twice divorced mother of two who had played an important role in the final phase of his life six years later. Reports of the brutal attacks on Sparks and six missing women appeared prominently in newspapers and on television throughout Washington and Oregon. Fear spread among the population, hitchhiking by young women was dropped sharply. Pressure mounted on law enforcement agencies, but the scarcity of physical evidence severely hampered them. Police would not provide reporters with the little information that was available in fear of compromising the investigation. Further similarities between the victims were noted. The disappearances all took place at night, usually near ongoing construction work, and were within a week of midterms or final exams. All the victims were wearing slacks or blue jeans when they disappeared, and at many crime scenes there were sightings of a man wearing a cast or a sling and driving a brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. The Oregon and Washington murders culminated on July 14th with the broad daylight abductions of two women from the crowded beach of Lake Sammamish State Park. Four female witnesses described an attractive young man wearing a white tennis outfit with his left arm in a sling, speaking with a light accent, perhaps Canadian or British, introducing himself as Ted. He asked for help in unloading a sailboat from his tan or bronze-coloured Volkswagen Beetle. Three refused, one accompanied him as far as his car, saw that there was no sailboat and fled. Three additional witnesses saw him approach Janice Ann Ott, 23, a probation caseworker at the King County Juvenile Court with the sailboat story and watched her leave the beach in his company. About four hours later, Denise Marie Naslud, a 19-year-old woman who was studying to become a computer programmer, left a picnic to go to the restroom and never returned. Bundy told Stephen McCord and FBI agent William Hagmeyer that Opp was still alive when he returned with Naslund and that he forced one to watch as he assaulted and murdered the other, but he later denied it in an interview with Lewis on the eve of his execution. King County Police, finally armed with a detailed description of their suspect and his car, posted flyers throughout the Seattle area. A composite sketch was printed in regional newspapers and broadcast on local television stations. Clofler, Rawl and DES employees and a UW psychology professor all recognised the profile, the sketch and the car, and reported Bundy as a possible suspect. But detectives were receiving up to 200 tips per day, though it's unlikely that a clean-cut law student with no criminal record could be the perpetrator. On September 6th, two grouse hunters stumbled across the skeletal remains of Ott and Naus near the service road in Issaquah, two miles east of Lake Sammamish State Park. An extra femur and several vertebrae were found at the site were later identified by Bundy as those of Hawkins. Six months later, forestry students from Green River Community College discovered the skulls and mantles of Healy, Rancourt, Parks and Ball on Taylor Mountain, where Bundy frequently hiked just east of Issaquah, 
Manson's remains were never recovered. In August of 1974, Bundy received a second acceptance letter from the University of Utah Law School and moved to Salt Lake City, leaving Clofler in Seattle. While he called Clofler often, he dated at least a dozen other women. As he'd studied the first year curriculum a second time, he was devastated to find out that the other students had some intellectual capability that he did not. He found the classes completely incomprehensible. It was a great disappointment to me, he said. A new string of homicides began the following month, including two who would remain undiscovered until Bundy confessed to them shortly before his execution. On September 2nd, Bundy raped and strangled a still unidentified hitchhiker in Idaho, then returned the next day to photograph and dismember the corpse before disposing of the remains in a nearby river. On October 2nd, he abducted 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox in Holiday, Utah, a suburb of Salt Lake City. Bundy confessed that Wilcox was walking on a poorly lit main roadway, where he parked his car and forced her into an orchard. He then restrained her and put it in his vehicle and drove back to his apartment, where he allegedly kept her for 24 hours. Bundy informed investigators that her remains were buried near Capitol Reef National Park, some 200 miles south of Holiday, but they were never found. On October 18th, Melissa Ann Smith, a 17-year-old daughter of a police chief in Midvale, another Salt Lake City suburb, disappeared after leaving a pizza parlour at around 9.30. Her new body was found in a nearby mountainous area nine days later. Post-mortem examination indicated that she may have remained alive for up to seven days following her disappearance. On October 31st, Laura Ann Amy, also 17, disappeared 25 miles south of Lehi after leaving a holiday party by herself just after midnight. She was last seen trying to hitchhike. Her naked body was found by hikers nine miles to the northeast in American Fork Canyon on Thanksgiving Day. The medical examiner estimated that Amy had died on November 20th, 20 days after her disappearance. Both Smith and Amy had been beaten, raped, sodomized and strangled with nylon stockings. Years later, Bundy described the post-mortem ritual with the corpses of Smith and Amy, including hair shampooing and application of makeup. In late afternoon of November 8th, Bundy approached 18-year-old telephone operator Carol DeRoach at Fashion Palace Mall in Murray, less than a smile from the Midvale restaurant where Smith was last seen. He identified himself as Officer Roseland of the Murray Police Department and told DeRoach that someone had attempted to break into her car. He asked her to accompany her to the station to file a complaint. When DeRoach pointed out to Bundy that he was driving a road that did not lead to the police station, he immediately pulled onto the shoulder and attempted to handcuff her. During their struggle, he inadvertently fastened both handcuffs to the same wrist, and DeRoach was able to open the car door and escape. Deborah Jean Kent, a 17-year-old student, disappeared after leaving a theatre production at the school to pick up her brother. The school's drama teacher and a student told police that a stranger had been asking them to come out and identify a car in the parking lot. Another student later saw the same man pacing at the rear of the auditorium, and the drama teacher spotted him again shortly after the end of the play. Outside the auditorium, investigators found a key that unlocked the handcuffs removed to DeRoch's wrist. Bundy eventually admitted to abducting Kent and keeping her at his apartment for a day, stating she was alive during half of it. In November, Clofler called King County Police a second time after reading that a young woman was disappearing in town surrounding Salt Lake City. Detective Randy Hergsheimer of the Major Crimes Division interviewed her in detail. By then, Bundy had risen considerably on the King's County hierarchy of suspicion, but the Lake Sammamish witness considered most reliable detectives failed to identify him in a photo lineup. In December, Cloak called the Salt Lake City Sheriff's Office and reported her suspicions. Bundy's name was added to the list of suspects, but at the time, no credible forensic evidence linked him to the Utah crimes. In January of 1975, Bundy returned to Seattle after his final exams and spent a week with Clofler, who did not tell him that she reported him to police on three occasions. She made plans to visit him in Salt Lake City in August. In 1975, Bundy shifted much of his criminal activity eastward from his base in Utah to Colorado. On January 12th, a 23-year-old registered nurse named Carrie-Ann Eileen Campbell disappeared while walking between the elevator and her room at the Wildwood Inn in Snowmass Village, 400 miles southeast of Salt Lake City. Her new body was found a month later next to a dirt road just outside the resort. According to the coroner's report, she'd been killed by blows to her head with a blunt instrument and left distinctive linear grooves depressed in her skull. Her assailant had split her left earlobe, and her body also bore deep cuts from a sharp weapon. On March 15th, 100 miles northeast of Snowmass, Valley ski instructor Julie Lynn Cunningham, 26, disappeared whilst walking to her apartment from a dinner date with a friend. Bundy later told Colorado investigators that he approached Cunningham on crutches and asked her to help carry his ski boots to his car. 
where he clubbed and handcuffed her before sexually assaulting her on the second site near Rifle, 90 miles west of Valley. Weeks later, he made the six hour drive from Salt Lake City to revisit her remains. Denise Lynn Oliverson, 25, disappeared near the U Utah Colorado border in Grand Junction on April 6th, whilst riding her bicycle to her parents' house. Her bike and sandals were found under a viaduct near a railroad bridge. Bundy stated he abducted Oliverson, killed her in his car near the Utah state line, and dumped her body in the Colorado River. This admission was supported by gas receipts, which showed he was in the city on the same day that Oliverson went missing. On May 6th, Bundy parked outside the Alameda Junior High School in Pocatello, Idaho, 160 miles north of Salt Lake City. And after seeing 12-year-old Lynette Dawn Culver walking alone by herself, he lured her into his vehicle before driving to the Holiday Inn Hotel. He then raped Culver and drowned her in the bathtub. He disposed of her body in the Snake River, north of Pocatello. Bundy later provided intimate details about Lynette's personal life and his confession. In mid-May, three of Bundy's Washington State DES co-workers, including Boone, visited him in Salt Lake City and stayed for a week in his apartment. He subsequently spent a week in Seattle with Clofer in early June and then discussed getting married the following Christmas. Again, Clofer made no mention of her multiple discussions with authorities in King County and Salt Lake County. Bundy disclosed neither his ongoing relationship with Boone nor a concurrent romance with a Utah law student. On June 28, 15-year-old Suzanne Curtis vanished from the campus of Bingham University in Provo, 45 miles south of Salt Lake City. Her murder became Bundy's last confession. The bodies of victims Wilcox, Kent, Cunningham, Oliverson, Culver and Curtis were never rediscovered. In August of 1975, Bundy was baptised into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, although he was not an active participant in service and ignored most of the church restrictions. He would later be excommunicated by the LDS Church following his 1976 kidnapping conviction. When asked his religious preferences after his arrest, Bundy answered Methodist, the religion of his childhood. In Washington state, investigators were still struggling to analyze the Pacific Northwest murder spree that had ended as abruptly as it began. In an effort to make more sense of the overwhelming mass of data, they resorted to the then innovative strategy of compiling a database. They used the King County payroll computer a huge primitive machine, by contemporary standards, but the only one available to their use. After inputting the many lists that had compiled classmates and acquaintances of each victim, Volkswagen owners named Ted, known sex offenders and so on, they queried the computer for coincidences. Out of thousands of names, 26 turned up on four lists, one of which was Bundy. Detectives also manually compiled a list of their 100 best suspects, and Bundy was on that list as well. He was literally at the top of the pile when word came to Utah of his arrest. On August 16th of 1975, Bundy was arrested by Utah Highway Patrol Officer Bob Haywood in Granger. Haywood observed Bundy cruising a residential area in his Volkswagen Beetle during the pre-dawn hours and fleeing at high speed after seeing the patrol car. He noticed that the Volkswagen's front passenger seat had been removed and placed on the rear seats and searched the car. He found a ski mask, a second mask fashioned from pantyhose, a crowbar, handcuffs, trash bag, coil of rope and an ice pick, and other items he initially assumed to be burglary tools. Bundy explained that the ski mask was for skiing, and he had found the handcuffs in a dumpster, and the rest were common household items. However, Detective Jerry Thompson remembered a similar suspect and car description from the remembered 1974 Deronch kidnapping, and Bundy's name from Clofler's phone call a month earlier. In a search of Bundy's apartment, police found a guide of Colorado ski resorts with a check mark by the Windward Inn and a brochure that advised the Viewmont High School play in Bontiful where Kent had disappeared. The police did not have significant evidence to detain Bundy, so he's released. Bundy later said that searchers missed a hidden collection of Polaroid photographs of his victims, which he destroyed after he was released. Salt Lake City Police placed Bundy on 24-hour surveillance, and Thompson flew to Seattle with two detectives to interview Clofler. She told them that in the year prior to Bundy's move to Utah, she discovered objects that she couldn't understand in her house and in Bundy's apartment. These items included crutches, a bag of plaster of Paris that he admitted stealing from a medical supply house, and a meat cleaver that he never used for cooking. Additional objects included surgical gloves, an oriental knife in a wooden case that he kept in his glove compartment, and a sack full of women's clothing. Bundy was perpetually in debt, and Clover suspected that he had stolen almost anything of significant value that he possessed. When she confronted him over his new TV and stereo, he warned her, if you tell anyone, I'll break your effing neck. She said Bundy became very upset whenever she considered cutting her hair, which was long and parted in the middle. 
She would sometimes awaken in the middle of the night to find him under the bed covers with a flashlight, examining her body. He kept a lug wrench, taped halfway up the handle in the trunk of her car, another Volkswagen Beetle, which she often borrowed for protection. The detectives confirmed that Bundy had not been with Clofler on any of the nights during which the specific Northwest victims had vanished, nor on the day Ott and Nasland were abducted from the Lake Sammamish State Park. Shortly thereafter, Clofler was interviewed by Seattle homicide detective Kathy McKesney and learned of the existence of Diane Edwards and her brief engagement to Bundy around Christmas of 1973. In September, Bundy sold his Volkswagen Beetle to a Midvale teenager. Utah police impounded it and FBI technicians dismantled and searched it. They found hairs matching samples obtained from Campbell's body. Later, they also identified hair strands from those of Smith and DeRonch. FBI lab specialist Robert Neal concluded that the presence of hair strands in one car matching three different victims who had never met one another would be a coincidence of mind-boggling rarity. On October 2nd, detectives put Bundy in a lineup. DeRonch immediately identified him as Officer Rosalind, and witnesses from Bountiful recognised him as the stranger at the Viewmont High School auditorium. There was insufficient evidence to link him to Kent, whose body had not yet been found, but more than enough evidence to charge him with aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault in the DeRonch case. He was freed on a $15,000 bail paid by his parents, and spent most of his time between indictment and trial in Seattle, living in Clofler's house. Seattle police had insignificant evidence to charge him with the Pacific Northwest murders, but kept him under close surveillance. When Ted and I stepped on the porch to go somewhere, Clofler wrote, so many unmarked police cards started up that it sounded like the beginning of the Indy 500. In November, the three principal Bundy investigators, Jerry Thompson from Utah, Robert Kepnell from Washington, and Michael Fisher from Colorado, met in Aspen, Colorado, and exchanged information with 30 detectives and prosecutors from five states. While officials left the meeting, which was later referred to as the Aspen Summit, convinced that Bundy was the murderer they sought, they agreed that more hard evidence would be needed so that they could charge him with any of the murders. In February of 1976, Bundy stood trial for the Durant kidnapping. On the advice of his attorney, John O'Connell, he waived his right to jury due to the negative publicity surrounding the case. After a four-day bench trial and a weekend of deliberation, Judge Stuart Hanson Jr. found him guilty of kidnapping and assault. In June, he was sentenced to 1 to 15 years in the Utah State Prison. In October, he was found hiding in bushes in the prison yard carrying an escape kit, roadmaps, airline schedules, and a social security card, and spent several weeks in solitary confinement. Later that month, Colorado authorities charged him with Campbell's murder. After a period of resistance, he waived exoneration proceedings and was transferred to Aspen in January of 1977. On June 7th of 1977, Bundy was transported 40 miles from the Garfield County Jail in Glenwood Springs to Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen for the preliminary hearing. He elected to serve his own attorney and as such was excused by the judge for wearing handcuffs and leg shackles. During a recess, he asked to visit the courthouse's law library to research his case. While shielded from his guard's view behind a bookcase, he opened a window and jumped to the ground from the second story, injuring his right ankle as he landed. After shedding an outer layer of clothing, Bundy limped through Aspen as roadblocks were being set up in the outskirts, then hiked south onto Aspen Mountain. Near its summit, he broke into a hunting cabin and stole food, clothes and a rifle. The following day, he left the cabin and continued south to the town of Crested Butt. For two days, he wandered aimlessly in the mountain, missing two trails that led downwards to his intended destination. On June 10th, he broke into a camping trailer in Maroon Lake, 10 miles south of Aspen, taking food and a ski parker, However, instead of continuing southward, he walked back north towards Aspen, eluding roadblocks and searching parties along the way. Three days later, he stole a car at the edge of the Aspen golf course. Cold, sleep-deprived and in constant pain from his sprained ankle, Bundy drove back into Aspen, where two police officers noticed his car weaving in and out of lanes and pulled him over. He had been a fugitive for six days. In the car were maps of the mountain area around Aspen that prosecutors were using to demonstrate the location of Campbell's body indicating that his escape had been planned. Back in jail in Glenwood Springs, Bundy ignored the advice of friends and legal advisors to stay put. The case against him, already weak at best, was decreasing steadily as pretrial motions considerably resolved in his favour and significant bits of evidence were ruled inadmissible. A more rational defendant might have realised that he stood a good chance for acquittal and that beating the murder charge in Colorado would probably have dissuaded other prosecutors, with as little as a year and a half to serve on the Durant conviction. Had Ted persevered, he could have been a free man. Instead, Bundy assembled a new escape plan. He acquired a detailed floor plan of the Garfield County Jail and a hacksaw blade from the other inmates. 
He accumulated $500 in cash, smuggled in over a six month period by visitors, Boone in particular. During the evenings, while other prisoners were showering, he sawed a hole about one square foot between the steel reinforced bars in his ceiling. Having lost 35 pounds, he was, he was able to wriggle through and explore the crawl space above. In the weeks that followed, multiple reports from an informant of movement in the ceiling during the night were not investigated. By late 1977, Bundy's impending trial became the talk of the small town of Aspen, and Bundy filed a motion for a change of venue to Denver. On December 23rd, the Aspen trial judge granted the request, but to Colorado Springs, where jurors had historically been hostile to murder suspects. On the night of December 30th, with most of the jail staff on Christmas break, and non-inviolent prisoners on furlough with their families, Bundy piled books and files on his bed, covered them with a blanket to simulate his sleeping body, and climbed into the crawl space. He broke through the ceiling of the apartment of the chief jailer, who was out for the evening with his wife. He changed into his street clothes and walked out the front door to freedom. After stealing a car, Bundy drove eastward out of Glenwood Springs, but the car broke down in the mountains on Interstate 70. A passing motorist gave him a ride to Vail, 60 miles to the east. From there he caught a bus to Denver, where he boarded a morning flight to Chicago. Back in Glenwood Springs, the jail skeleton crew did not discover the escape until noon on December 31st more than 17 hours later. By then, Bundy was already in Chicago. From Chicago, Bundy traveled by train to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he was present in a local tavern on January 2nd. Five days later, he stole a car and drove south to Atlanta, where he boarded a bus and arrived in Tallahassee, Florida on the morning of January 8th. He stayed for one night at a hotel before renting a room under the alias Chris Hagen at a boarding house near the Florida State University campus. Bunda later said he initially resolved to finding legitimate employment to refrain from further criminal activity, knowing he could probably remain free and undetected in Florida indefinitely as long as he did not attract the attention of police. But his loan job application at a construction site had been abandoned when he was asked to produce identification. He reverted to his old habits of shoplifting and stealing money and credit cards from women's wallets left in shopping carts at local grocery stores. In the early hours of January 15th of 1978, one week after his arrival in Tallahassee, Bundy entered the FSU's Chia Omega sorority house through a rear door with a faulty locking mechanism. Beginning at about 2.45am, he bludgeoned Margaret Elizabeth Bowman, 21, with a piece of oak firewood as she slept, then garroted her with nylon stockings. He then entered the bedroom of 20-year-old Lisa Jeanette Levy and beat her unconscious, strangled her and tore one of her nipples, bit deeply on her left buttock and sexually assaulted her with a hair mist bottle. In an adjourning bedroom, he attacked Kathy Kleiner, 21, breaking her jaw and deeply lacerating her shoulder, and Karen Chandler, 21, who suffered a concussion, broken jaw, loss of teeth and crushed finger. Chandler and Kleiner survived the attack. Tallahassee detectives determined that the four attacks took place in a total of less than 15 minutes, with an earshot of more than 30 witnesses who heard nothing. After leaving the sorority house, Bundy broke into a basement apartment eight blocks away and attacked 21-year-old FSU student Cheryl Thomas, dislocating her shoulder and fracturing her jaw and skull in five places. She was left with permanent deafness and equilibrium damage that ended her dance career. On Thomas's bed, police found a semen stain and a pantyhose mask, containing two hairs similar to Bundy's in class and characteristic. On February 8th, Bundy drove 150 miles east to Jacksonville in a stolen FSU van. In a parking lot, he approached 14-year-old Leslie Parenta, the daughter of Jacksonville Police Department Chief of Detectives, identifying herself as Richard Burton, Fire Department, but retreated when Parenta's older brother arrived and confronted him. That afternoon, he backtracked 60 miles westward to Lake City. At Lake City Junior High School the following morning, 12-year-old Kimberly Diane Leach was summoned to her homeroom by a teacher to receive her forgotten purse. She never returned to class. Several weeks later, after an intensive search, her partially mummified remains were found in a pig farrowing shed near Sewanee River State Park, 35 miles northwest of Lake City. Forensic experts summarised that Leach had been raped before having her throat cut and her genitals mutilated with a knife. On February 12th, with insufficient cash to pay for his overdue rent and a growing suspicion that police were closing in on him, Bundy stole a car and fled Tallahassee, driving westward across the Florida Panhandle. Three days later, at around 1am, he was stopped by Pensacola police officer David Lee near the Alabama state line after a wanton warrants check showing his Volkswagen Beetle was stolen. When told he was under arrest, Bundy kicked Lee's leg out from under him and took off running. Lee fired two warning shots, then gave chase and tackled him. 
the two struggled over Lee's gun before the officer finally subdued and arrested Bundy. In a stolen vehicle were three sets of IDs belonging to female FSU students, 21 stolen credit cards and a stolen television set. Also found were a pair of dark rimmed non-prescription glasses and a pair of plaid slacks, later identified as the disguise worn by Richard Burton Fire Department in Jacksonville. As Lee transported his suspect to jail, unaware that he had just arrested one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives, he heard Bundy say, I wish you had killed me. Following a change of venue to Miami, Bundy stood trial for the Chia Omega homicides and assaults in June of 1979. The trial was covered by 250 reporters from five continents and was the first to be televised nationally in the United States. Despite the presence of five court-appointed attorneys, Bundy again handled his own defence. From the beginning, he sabotaged the entire defence effort out of spite, distrust and grandiose delusion. Nelson later wrote, Ted was facing murder charges with a possible death sentence, and all that mattered to him apparently was for him to be in charge. According to Mike Minerva, a Tallahassee police defender and member of the defence team, a pre-trial plea bargain was negotiated in which Ted would plead guilty to killing Levy, Bowman and Leach, in exchange for a firm 75-year prison sentence. Prosecutors were amenable to a deal by one account, because prospects of losing at trial were very good. Bundy, on the other hand, saw the plea deal not only as a means to avoiding the death penalty, but also as a tactical move. He could enter his plea, then wait a few years for evidence to disintegrate and become lost and for witnesses to die, move on and retract his testimony. Once the case against him deteriorated beyond repair, he would file a post-conviction motion, he would set aside the plea and secure an acquittal. At the last minute, however, Bundy refused the deal. It made him realise he was going to stand in front of a whole world and say he was guilty. Minerva said he just couldn't do it. At trial, crucial testimony came from the Chia Omega sorority members, Connie Hastings, who placed Bundy in the vicinity of the sorority house that evening, and Nita Neary, who saw him leaving the house clutching the murder weapon. Incriminating physical evidence included impressions of the bite wound that Bundy had inflicted on Levy's left butt cheek, which forensic ontologist Richard Suveron and Lowell Levine matched the castings of Bundy's teeth. The jury deliberated for less than seven hours before convicting Bundy on July 24th of 1979. Trial judge Edward Cower imposed death sentences for the murder convictions. Six months later, a second trial took place in Orlando for the abduction and murder of Leach. Bundy was found guilty once again after less than eight hours of deliberation, due principally to the testimony of eyewitnesses who saw him leading Leach in the schoolyard to his stolen van. During the penalty phase of Leach's trial, Bundy took advantage of an obscure Florida law, providing that a marriage declaration in court in the presence of a judge constituted a legal marriage. As he was questioning Boone, who had moved to Florida to be near Bundy and testified on his behalf during both trials and was again testifying on his behalf, he asked her to marry him. She accepted and Bundy declared to the court that they were legally married. On February 10th of 1980, Bundy was sentenced for a third time to death by electrocution. As the sentence was announced, he reportedly stood and shouted, Tell the jury that they were wrong. This third death sentence would be the one ultimately carrying out nearly nine years later. On October 24th of 1982, Boone gave birth to the daughter, Rose Bundy. While conjugal visits were not allowed at the Florida State Prison in Ralford, where Bundy was incarcerated, inmates were known to pull their money in order to bribe guards to allow them intimate alone time with female visitors. Shortly after the conclusion of Leach's trial and the beginning of the long appeal process that followed, Bundy initiated a series of interviews with Stephen McCured and Hugh Ainsworth, speaking mostly in third person to avoid the stigma of confession. He began for the first time to divulge details of his crimes and thought processes. Bundy recounted his career as a thief, confirming Clopla's long-time suspicion that he had shoplifted virtually everything of substance that he owned. The big payoff for me, he said, was actually possessing whatever I'd stolen. I really enjoyed having something that I had wanted and gone out and taken. Possession proved to be an important motive for rape and murder as well. Sexual assault, he said, filled his need to totally possess his victims. At first, he killed his victims as a matter of expendency to eliminate the possibility of being caught, but later murder became part of the adventure. The ultimate possession was in fact the taking of life, he said, and then the physical possession of the remains. Bundy also confided in special alien William Hagmeyer of the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit. Hagmeyer was struck by the deep, most mysterious satisfaction that Bundy took in murder. He said that after a while, murder was not just a crime of lust or violence. Hagmeyer related it to becoming possession. The victim becomes a part of you, and you two are forever one, and the grounds where they were killed or leave them become sacred to you. 
and you'll always be drawn back to them. Bundy told Hagemeyer that he considered himself to be an amateur and impulsive killer in his early years, before moving into what he termed his prime and predator phase, at about the time of Healy's murder in 1974. This implied that he began killing well before 1974, although he never explicitly admitting to having done so. In early 1986, an execution date, March 4th, was, was set on the Chiomega convictions. The US Supreme Court issued a brief stay, but the execution was quickly rescheduled. In April, shortly after the new date, July 2nd was announced. Bundy finally confessed to Hagemeyer and Nelson what they believed to be the full range of his, of his depredations, including details of what he did to some of his victims after their death. He told them that he revisited Taylor Mountain, Issaquah, and other secondary crime scenes, often several times to lie with his victims and perform sexual acts on their bodies, until putrefaction forced him to stop. He drove for several hours each way and remained the entire night. In Utah, he applied makeup to Smith's lifeless face and repeatedly washed Amy's hair. If you've got time, he told Hagemeyer they could be anything they wanted to be. He decapitated approximately 12 of his victims with a hacksaw and kept at least one group of severed heads, probably the four later found in Taylor Mountain. Less than 15 hours before the scheduled July 2nd execution, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals stayed it indefinitely and remanded the Chiomega case to review on multiple technicalities, including Bundy's mental competency to stand trial and the outrageous instructions of the trial judge during the penalty phase, requiring the judge to break a 6-6 six, six tie between life imprisonment and the death penalty, which ultimately was never resolved. A new date, November 18th, was then set to carry out the Leach sentence. The 11th Circuit Council issued a stay on November 17th. In mid-1988, the 11th Circuit ruled against Bundy, and December, the Supreme Court denied a motion to review the ruling over the dissents of Justice Thurgood Marshall and William Jane Brennan Jr. Within hours of that final denial, a firm execution date of January 24th, 1989 was announced. Bundy's journey through the appeal court had been usually rapid for a capital murder case. Contrary to popular belief, the courts moved Bundy as fast as they could, even the prosecutors acknowledged that Bundy's lawyers never employed delaying tactics. Though people everywhere seethed at the apparent delay in the execution of Ted Bundy was actually on the fast track. With all appeal avenues exhausted and no further motivation to deny his crimes, Bundy agreed to speak frankly with investigators. He confessed to Capitol that he had committed all eight of the Washington and Oregon homicides, in which he was the prime suspect. He described three additional previously unknown victims in Washington and two in Oregon, who he declined to identify if indeed he ever knew their identities. He said he left a fifth corpse, Manson's, on Taylor Mountain, but incinerated her head in Clothless fireplace. He described the Issaquah crime scene, and it was almost like he was there. He was infatuated with the idea because he spent so much time there. He is just totally consumed with murder all the time. Nelson's impressions were similar. It was the absolute misogyny of his crimes that stunned me. She wrote, his manifest rage against women. He had no compassion at all. He was totally engrossed in the details. His murders were his life accomplishments. Bundy confessed to detectives from Idaho, Utah, and Colorado that he had committed numerous additional homicides, including several that were unknown to the police. He explained that when he was in Utah, he could bring his victims back to his apartment, where he could reenact scenarios depicting on the covers of detective magazines. A new ulterior strategy quickly became apparent. He withheld many details, hoping to parlay the incomplete information into yet another stay of execution. There were other buried remains in Colorado, he admitted, but refused to elaborate. The new strategy, immediately dubbed Ted's Bone for Time, served only to deepen the resolve of authorities to see Bundy executed on schedule, and yield little new detailed information. In cases where he did give details, nothing was found. Colorado detective Matt Lindvall interpreted this as a conflict between his desire to postpone his execution by divulging information and his need to remain in total possession, the only person who knew his victim's true resting place. When it became clear that no further stays would be in forthcoming to the court, Bundy supporters began lobbying for the only remaining option, executive clemency. Diane Weiner, a young Florida attorney and Bundy's last purported love interest, asked the families of several Colorado and Utah victims to petition Florida Governor Bob Martinez for a postponement to give Bundy time to reveal more information, or refused. The families already believed that the victims were dead and that Ted had killed them, wrote Nelson. They didn't need his confession. Martinez made it clear that he would not agree to further delay in any case. We are not going to have the system manipulated, he told reporters. For him to be negotiating for his life over the bodies of victims is despicable. 
Boone had championed Bundy's innocence throughout all of his trials and felt deeply betrayed by his admission that he was, in fact, guilty. She moved back to Washington with her daughter and refused to accept his phone call on the morning of his execution. She was hurt by his relationship with Diane, Nelson wrote, and devastated by his sudden wholesale confessions in his last days. Hagmeyer was present during Bundy's final interview with investigators. On the eve of his execution, he talked of suicide. He did not want to give the state the satisfaction of watching him die, Hagmeyer said. Bundy was executed in the Rayfield Electrical Chair at 7.16am on Tuesday, January 24th of 1989. His last words were directed at his attorney, Jim Coleman, and Methodist minister, Fred Lawrence. Jim and Fred, I'd like you to give my love to my family and friends. Hundreds of revealers sang in a pasture across from the prison as the execution was carried out, then cheered as the white hearse containing Bundy's corpse departed the prison. He was cremated in Gainesville, and his ashes scattered in an undisclosed location in the Cascade Range of Washington State, in accordance to his will. So this is the story of Ted Bundy, a true monster of a man who spent his life doing evil deeds. I just hope the families are okay and are at peace, and I hope they continue to live good lives. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a like and comment, and please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos. Anyway, that's it from me. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you next time. Bye for now.